friends. Um, my name is Jose Aguto, and I am the Associate Director of the Catholic Climate Covenant. And thank you all for, uh, for your forbearance as we take our first journey uh, through the Zoom conference uh, uh, app. Um, and please pardon as we work through the kinks. Um, we are especially blessed today uh, for the first time to welcome uh, our Indigenous brothers and sisters uh, into dialogue, into learning and understanding um, where they are coming from. Uh, Pope Francis has asked us to, to accompany them, to listen and to learn from them. Uh, and so we are blessed today, if you don't mind me um, removing my share screen, um, to, um, to welcome um, several of our um, partners uh, and colleagues into this space. Um, and um, in today's webinar, which is entitled Sacred Lands, Sacred Spaces, listening to, learning from, and accompanying Native American peoples in the spirit of Laudato Si. And in Laudato Si, Pope Francis wrote, it is essential to show special care for indigenous communities and their cultural traditions. For them, land is not a commodity, but rather a gift from God and from their ancestors who rest there, a sacred space with which they need to interact if they are to maintain their identity and values. When they remain on their land, they themselves care best for it. How much we can learn from them. The lives of indigenous peoples are a living memory of the mission that God has entrusted to us all, the protection of our common home. And so, with those words, we seek to be in listening, learning, allyship, and participation with Indigenous peoples through this webinar, our first foray into that accompaniment. And so we begin with a prayer, which I'll bring up on my screen. which comes from Sister Jose Hobde. And so let us take a moment of silence to bring ourselves in the presence of our creator. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh great God, you give me this day as a special gift in taking this step into the day I accept everything it will bring, whether part of my plan or not. Teach me to accept every gift that comes my way today. Help me to use each gift wisely, to love my brothers and sisters, and to care for my mother, the earth. O oh, great God, you created in me as I am. In taking this step, I accept myself as I am, as I have been in the past and as I will be in the future. I ask that today I will be true to the way you made me. Help me to walk respectfully on my mother, the earth, so none of its plants will be crushed. Help me to walk in the people's lives in the same way, so none will be bruised. O oh, great God, you created me and everything around me with a sense of mystery. I now step into that mystery and put my arms around it. Help me to accept the things of this day I do not and cannot understand. Help me to use the encounters with mystery to draw nearer to you, to my brothers and sisters, and all to all you have made. Amen. Father and the Son. Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, friends. Um, so first, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you within two days. Also, please type your questions in the Q&A box. The Q&A box should be reserved for questions. For those who have been to our past webinars, you will notice that we have switched to Zoom webinar from GoToWebinar. We hope again that it all runs smoothly and we'll try and troubleshoot any of the issues you might have. And if you do have any, please put those issues in the chat box. 
<clears throat> I am uh, blessed to introduce our three presenters. Uh, the first is Nikki Cooley, who is the co-manager of the Tribal Climate Change Program of the Institute for Tribal Environmental Pre Professionals. She is of the Diné tribe by way of Shanto and Blue, Grap, Blue Grap Gap, Arizona. And she'll tell you more about her ancestry during her presentation. Nikki received her bachelor's and master's of forestry from Northern Arizona University with a few years of postgraduate study at Michigan State University. At NAU, she worked extensively with the Cherokee tribe of North Carolina, as well as others including the Kaibab Paiute tribe. She co-founded the Native American River Guide Training Program and is a river guide and cultural interpreter along the Colorado River, Grand Canyon, and San Juan River. Second, I am blessed to welcome Deb Echohawk, Pawnee Oto, also known as the Keeper of the Seeds and works for the Pawnee Nation Division of Health and Community Services elder meals and caregiver support. Deb originated the Pawnee Seed Preservation Project and is the director of that project. And lastly, very happy to introduce Ronnie O'Brien who also originated the Pawnee Seed Preservation Project. She is a Catholic from Nebraska and has spent the past 17 years working with Deb on this project, bringing back the tribe's sacred ancestral corn from the brink of extinction. Ronnie is also an instructor at Central Community College Hastings and the outreach coordinator for the indigenous programs for the St. Kateri Conservation Center. So with that, we are blessed to start with Nikki um, and I will commence with resharing my screen and uh, Ronnie um, or Nikki, feel free to begin once that happens. Okay. Good. Well, thank you so much, Jose, and everyone else. Um, thank you all for being here, and I'm excited. I wish I could see all your beautiful faces. Um, as uh, Jose um, introduced me, I want to talk a little bit about tribes, climate change, and a little bit of the culture um, and how all that is um, interconnected. But first, I'd like to introduce myself um, um, in the Navajo way, the Ne. The neck etcher. So on the next slide, um, you'll see my my clans. Um, I am Kenya Ani. Um, we're matrilineal, so everything goes through our mother's lineage. My brothers and sisters and I have the same um, clan. Have the same clan. Um, my mother's on the left side. My um, my, my grandmother is on the right side with my daughter. So we are all Kenyaani Tyrant House clan. And on the next slide, um, so I'm of the Tyrant House clan and I'm She'e Lok at the Ne, a Bashish Chin, Ado Tohead Lini the Ne, a Dash Che, the Sana E Dash Nele, a Kot Awe the Ne, a Sun and Nishle. So I'm of the Tyrant House clan, born for the Reed people clan. And uh, my paternal grandfathers are from the water that are. Many Goats clan, maternal grandparents are uh, from the Water That Flows Together clan. And I come from Shanto and Blue Gap, Arizona, where I grew up um, speaking Navajo and planting corn and everything. So in the background is my mother's um, cornfield, which has which um, used to be um, at least five miles in size. Um, we've greatly downsized it um, due to the drought conditions that we have. But it's important for us to introduce ourselves in the Navajo way uh, because we acknowledge the, the natural environment, our relatives that are, um, you know, the elk, the, the eagles, the hawks, and the even the ants and whatnot. So um, on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about my um, climate change program that I do with the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals. For short, we call it ITEP. And we're based out of um, Flagstaff, Arizona at Northern Arizona University. Um, but, um, and we've been around since 1993, actually. Um, we have air quality, we have waste and response, working on brownfields, uh, super fun sites. 
we have pesticides, we have water council, we have a program that works with K through college students. And, um, but the climate change program was created in 2009 to assist tribes in addressing climate impacts in their communities. And we do this through in-person trainings, online webinars, uh, we provide direct one-on-one -on -one or group assistance, technical assistance. Um, we work with individual tribes or we, we work with many partners across the country, including academic, federal, um, nonprofit, uh, for-profit entities. Um, but our main partners are the tribes. And we do a ton of outreach like I'm doing today um, on what is going out, uh, what is going on in um, the world. So to date, we have served over, I believe, 300 representatives from the different tribes and agencies and organizations. And our goal is to work with all 574 federally recognized tribes. But with that, we also work with state recognized tribes as much as we can. Um, so we're primarily, actually, we are 100% grant funded. Um, we are looking for more diverse funding um, because um, everybody is really looking to use federal funding to build their climate programs. Um, my program is fi primarily funded by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. They have a tribal climate resilience program that specifically funds tribes to build their capacity to address climate change. Now, I'm trying to help them find implementation funds to actually do the work on the ground. So on the next slide, I want to show you just a list of people who are on our advisory committee. So it's just not me sitting in the office saying, this is what tribes should do, this is what they should learn. Rather, we actually work for the tribes um, and we work in partnership with our federal tribal uh, partners. Um, we have currently five tribal representatives from across the country. Um, and then we also work with different representatives from the different federal agencies. Uh, but also the BIA have, they, um, USGS and different entities have tribal climate resilience li liaisons that are with each region has their own liaison. Alaska has their own, the Southwest has their own, New Mexico has their own, but they don't have anyone on staff right now. So these are the people who actually work on the ground and may be aware of the different technology or resources that are out there to help tribes. And uh, we actually, and then they, kind of inform our work so and out of this program since 2009 when I started there was very few tribes actually working on climate change per se because climate change was not funded uh, readily as it is now um, I would have to say the Obama administration really jump-started that process by giving money to the BIA uh, tribal resilience program and um, um, now it's like every tribe is really trying, every tribal community is really wanting to build their program. And so on the next slide, you'll see just a little bit of, of a snapshot of all the documents that are out there, tribal adaptation plans and climate assessments, vulnerability assessments, as we call them. These are living documents that are created by the tribes or their partners. Um, so, for example, the Swinomish tribe actually was doing it way before 2009 when our program was created, having their tribal leadership say that there was a climate crisis and they actually started addressing it in the early 2000s. And they're working to rebuild their clam gardens and they're working in conjunction with their tribal elders, their community members, to bring that um, back to the people. And they're located in uh, the Puget Sound in uh, um, Washington State. So these are there's a ton of there's a ton of plans out there now. Now there it's growing. That we have a list of sixty, maybe a little bit more that I'm not aware of. But there these are slowly being created to say, hey, this is what's going on on the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribal lands, and this is how we want to address those impacts like wildfire, bark beetle, and so on, beaver rust habitat restoration, and so on. But you can find that on the ITEP website if you, and I'll make sure to put it in the chat box um, in a little bit. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the tribal adaptation plans. You can view it. You can see what tribes are doing. Some are more technical, some are more culturally, um, 
focused um, and whatnot. So and others have a good cross between the traditional and modern um, knowledge. So on the next slide, I'll show you, I, 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 I'm sure I don't, um, um, if you, let me see if you press it again, Jose, the other pictures might come up. Um, yeah. So the, 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 I probably don't have to tell you about all the climate impacts that are happening. You probably have experienced it. You have heard about it in the news. Nashville is, was flooding or still is flooding just, re, just as recently as a week ago. Um, so there's a lot that's going on around us and it's happening so much in the news. We're kind of desensitized to it. Like it happens all the time. Um, for these tribal communities, which is my focus, um, we're experiencing some of the, these impacts almost all at once um, and, and whatnot in, in the same year or in the, in the course of a few months and whatnot. So we're really, and we have a small land, we all have smaller land bases. So we're really trying to see how we can preserve the environment um, as best we can. And on the next slide, you'll see a few more of the photographs. Um, and I just want to notably say on the left hand upper left hand corner, um, they're they're becoming really extreme. I'm 41 years old, and uh, where I live has it's always the Southwest is hot, but where I live here in Flagstaff, but also where I grew up, it wasn't always as hot a, as it usually is down south. And last summer, I cannot maybe I'm getting soft, um, but. It was so hot, um, it was unbearable. I couldn't believe how hot it was. Um, the wells are drying up. We have to reduce our uh, livestock, sheep, goats, horses, because we can't really afford to drive 35 miles one way just to haul water for them. A lot of us don't have the water infrastructure, but that picture in the upper left-hand corner, another um impact are uh these sand dunes that are so the soils aren't being stabilized by the plants that are that used to grow strongly due to the consistent rainfall and the water tables but those are decreasing so now we don't have the plant life to stabilize the soil so we're having a lot of these sand dunes these wind events that are blowing sand and creating barriers for people to go in and out of a community or even uh, grandma and grandpa who live out in the rural area that have just one way in and out. So there, there's a lot that's going on and I could go on all day about it. But I just wanted to show you a little bit of the impacts and kind of what the on the next slide I'll show you kind of the framework that we do use in our trainings in our workshops, uh, whether they're one day workshops or three day workshops that we do or online workshops. Uh, we follow this framework kind of like a, a five step process and we call it the Sadie process. Um, and, and it's um, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, phase five. There's a lot of other institutions that have uh, kind of a framework. Some are seven steps, some are five, some are three, um, but basically they all kind of try to gear or steer the person mm. or the community towards this um, uh, adaptation plan. Um, and, and this is how, and we give you the directions to do it. At ITEP, what we, what we uh, say is that we, you must engage the community. It doesn't matter if they're the environmental director, but uh, they should also be maybe the janitor, the bus driver, um, maybe somebody who doesn't work um, and works from home and takes care of the community in that way. Um, and But we also use traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge or local knowledge as we call it. Um, and we also call it living document. You should never gather dust. So this is kind of the framework that we, we, we um, propose to people to use and I'll send another link where you can find um, all the documents to our adaptation toolkit that we provide to tribes. So now I'm going to give you a few examples starting on the next slide with um, show you what tribes are doing out there. The Quapaw Nation of Oklahoma, they are writing, they have written a tribal hazard mitigation plan and I believe they're going through a revision process and they're in Northeast Oklahoma, very small community, um, kind of checkerboarded by private lands, um, uh, non-tribal lands, trust lands. And um, 
they haven't been experiencing a ton of flooding in the past few years. So on, in their plan, they're actually focusing on the, the, the list that you see above, expansive soils, subsidence, uh, flooding, severe weather, um, even more to tornado warnings, wildfires. Um, and they're focusing on these because they're the most immediate, um, they have the most immediate impacts on the community members, especially the vulnerable um, uh, members of our community. So, and then on the next slide, there's another tribe in North Central Wisconsin call, called the Lac du Flambeau tribe, who um, are writing um, or have written and just released a multi-hazard mitigation plan. Um, and this is, I think you'll find it interesting because in addition to the environmental impacts, they are also focusing on the illegal drug crisis. There's a lot of opioid, um, um, there's an epidemic of opioid users up there. So, and then also school violence and armed attack. Um, so they're really focusing on that. And I thought that was very unusual because other tribes don't know that you can actually include those things. So they're focusing on really how the, uh, on, on other things other than the environment. Because if you have, um, you know, emergency services that are concentrating on one impact and then something else happens down the road, um, you, you need to have a plan of how you will disperse emergency services to help that emergency down the road. So, um, and then on the next slide, I really like their, one of their quotes. Um, For the tribe, natural resources and cultural resources are, are natural resources are cultural resources. So they don't separate those. Um, and it's an integral part of the environment, the community, and it helps it thrive. Um, that when I was reading this plan, it really struck me and I really appreciated that, um, that, that quote. On the next slide, up in Alaska, the Oscarville Tribal Climate Adaptation Plan, there are about over 260 tribes up alone in Alaska, villages, tribes, and um, they're all writing adaptation plans. And this is one of the adaptation plans that really struck me because of the artwork. So they're really infusing their tribal culture, their whole being of who they are, their identity into their plan. So they make a lot of references to the traditional stories, the animals. Um, you'll see that photograph and a local artist is the one that created it. They use a lot of quotes from the community members um, and in the native language, but also in the English language, um, but it's a holistic approach and they really, really included the community in every step of the way. Um, they, there's not, they didn't find a word for resilience in their Yupik language. So what they did was they came up with a word that translated uh, resilience into the Yupik language. So um, I thought that was really neat and it's online, you can, um, read it um, at your heart's leisure. Um, on the next slide is the, up in Maine, the Aristuk Band of Mi'kmaq Indians, a uh, very small community, beautiful, but to revive some of their cultural practices and their cultural foods, they have created a tribal fishery that feeds the community. Um, due to the high volume of mercury and other chemicals in their local waters. So they stopped eating fish a long time ago. And now the tribal fish hatchery is allowing them to gather. Uh, this was post pre pre pandemic, but and they plan to do this post pandemic too. that to gather and tell stories and to be with each other and maybe sing some songs, uh, but really reviving that tribal culture again uh, and bringing it to the community, but also they sell a lot of their local foods um, to the local restaurants that are off the reservation. The, the wastewater from the tribal fish hatchery actually feeds the garden that you see. It's, the, it's fabulous. It's an amazing garden. And then on the next slide, um, we'll go to uh, Northern California, the Yurok tribe who have, I think they just recently um, gave a personhood, uh, rights of personhood to the Klamath River. And they're trying to take down a dam um, that is, has blocked their traditional food of salmon um, and their adaptation plan heavily 
relies on the the elders, the community or the cultural committee, and the, their number one priori, priority, as you see up there, is to protect and to preserve the Yurok language and culture. Because culture, remember, culture and na uh, natural resources are one and the same to all, all these tribes. And the next, uh, the next one is another tribe in the Spokane, Washington region. Um, they also have a tribal fish hatchery. And if you ever get a chance to visit it, um, they have the most amazing artwork inside their tribal fish hatchery is to, to um, bring back the story of how salmon came to their people and how it saved them and how they're reviving that tradition. And they actually hire a lot of local youth. They hire local tribal citizens and um, they feed their people too. So it is absolutely amazing. Um, I'm almost done here. Um, I wanna go to, to the Southwest on the next slide is the Black Mesa Water Coalition. And if you go ahead and press the next, um, yeah, that one is, um, they're doing, they're an organization which actually helped um, put pressure on the community of Navajo and Hopi to uh, hold Peabody Coal Company responsible for using a lot of the aquifer water and also polluting the area where they closed down the mines at. But they're actually using um, restorative ecology to rebuild these cornfields, as you see, using traditional irrigation methods. There are no tractors, there's no backhoes out there, just the young people and the older people um, working together to build that up. And on the next slide, um, their whole purpose is to bring back the food system. Eh means family, relatives. And so they're really bringing that to the small community of Pinyon and Hard Rock. They're very dry communities these days. Um, and But they're really working with the local elders and bringing back those practices of butchering sheep, cooking corn the traditional way and getting and telling the stories along with it. Um, and on the next slide, I just want to also mention um, my children's school. If you press it a couple more times, a couple more pictures will show up. Is the Star School? It's called Service to All Relations. It's the first off-grid school in the nation. Pre totally run by solar and wind power. They have their own well. They compost. They butcher. The no nobody's forced to do this. It's all learning. These young kids are actually tan, uh, grinding corn and also tanning a sheepskin hide. So the older kids, if they choose to, are the ones that help butcher a sheep and propose dispose of it properly. And also um, they use a lot of their um, prayers in there, whatever faith that they follow, which is what I really like. But also they gather a lot of the um, local foods and whatnot. And it's all in 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 hopes of teaching them to, you can go on to the next slide, to acknowledge all living things, um, all living um, beings and whatnot. So that's really important. That spider woman, she taught my people how to weave and to survive the cold winters. Because as you'll see on the next slide, that the whole all of Mother Earth is our relatives. We're one and the same and we can't be without our mother. And our faith is heavily intertwined, interconnected with the earth. And I just wanna say, and I was telling Jose and the others that um, this is a, a process of healing for me in a way to present to you all because of the history that I personally have, but the history that I have with, my people have with the church and whatnot. And I have every faith in my family represented and I have never spoken a bad word about them. And it's all about healing and understanding that we all have to come together to protect the waters, the earth, the sky and all our animal relatives and whatnot. So um, with that, I'm done with my presentation and you can go ahead and give us, um, if you don't mind going back one slide of, um, you can contact us. So I really appreciate it. And I will pass the torch on to um, Ronnie or Deb. So thank you so much. And um, thank you. Oh my gosh, Nikki, that was just so inspirational on so many levels. Um, and 
wanting to move on to even further inspiration and, and bring Ronnie and Deb uh, to present. Thank you. Okay, um, I am Ronnie O'Brien and I am going to go first and save Deb for last uh, so you can really hear about her culture. <clears throat> so um, this beginning slide that I'm starting with, uh, thank you for this opportunity, uh, by the way, this is a large number of participants, I can hardly believe it. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be able to share this story. Um, there, it, like Nikki said, there is a, there's a movement in the United States among native uh, native people uh, to bring back their way of life and their culture through the, the, through the earth and their plants. And um, so it's just great to be a part of that. And especially my work with the Pawnee. Um, so, and climate change is important to this, this whole thing. We've seen a lot of changes in, in the last 17 or 18 years. So. Uh, I want to begin with the background here to build some background so you understand where this story goes. Uh, the Pawnee are, you can see them in Nebraska, uh, right here. They start, they came from Central America and wound up in this area. And at one time they were all Wichita. And then uh, probably at least 1100 years ago, uh, they got so large that part of them broke away or maybe half and came up to where I am in now in Nebraska and Northern Kansas and became the Pawnee. So um, that's how they got to, to where I am today. And for 900 to 1100 years, they brought the corn with them and they continued from Central America, they continued to develop corn varieties for 900 to 1100 years uh, while they were in Nebraska before they were agreed and they agreed to be moved to Oklahoma because their life became so difficult here. Um, and they moved in 1874 and 1875 uh, to Oklahoma. So 147 years ago, they moved uh, to Oklahoma. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, uh, I first met Deb Echohawk when I was at the Archway. I was the director of education. This was a national um, trails attraction that's in the middle of Nebraska about all of the westward migration trails uh, that the settlers followed. And we opened in 2000. And from the time that we opened, I had people coming to get me as the manager to speak to someone. And it was a native person usually uh, that would say, you do a great job of telling the history of everything, uh, all of the routes that came through here and all this wonderful history, but you're missing at least a thousand years. And you really need to do something based upon Native Americans. So it took a while, but in 2003, I finally decided it was time to start a program uh, about Native Americans. And I wanted to have it be about the Pawnee because we were in their homeland and they were they had a large territory. So I knew it would encompass most of Nebraska, at least in, in some of Kansas. And I wanted to have corn as part of it because I had read about the Pawnee. Actually, my husband's ancestors, the O'Briens, settled nine miles from where we are in 1861 and became very good friends with a Pawnee chief. Uh, and I learned all about them from uh, the chief from my husband's grandpa who lived to be almost hundred and he talked about it for 11 years. He, uh, he knew his grandparents well. So I had two reasons to really want to contact the Pawnee. I knew nobody that was Pawnee, they're, they're gone from our area in central Nebraska. The, uh, it's a very minimal uh, population of, 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 at all of natives. So I decided to call. I had no idea where the Pawnee were. I found out they were in Oklahoma and uh, called to see if I could have someone. I decided if I was going to start a program about the Pawnee, instead of reading what some white man wrote 100 years ago, I wanted the Pawnee to help me create that program if they would and teach about their own culture in their, in their homeland. Uh, so long story short, I finally was put through to Deb Echohawk because she was their director of education. And they didn't know who else to have me talk to because I wanted to have a garden as part of it and they didn't know anything about how they might do that uh, because there just wasn't much left. Uh, so I, they put me through to the absolute perfect person, Deb. We talked for one hour and at the end of that one hour, I grew up on a corn farm in the middle of Nebraska. At the end of one hour, I knew that my relationship with corn and land was nothing compared to the relationship that Deb and her tribe and her people had with the corn and the land 
the true corn and land of Nebraska. Uh, so she asked me if I would be willing, uh, I, I, I asked if she had corn I could grow to show fourth graders in Nebraska what a garden would look like planted the uh, traditional way. And the next slide will show that, how the Pawnee planted corn. And I learned from her that there was uh, hardly anything left, um, a mayonnaise jar of one variety and a handful of seeds of another. And that was all they had left of their um, 13 to 19 varieties that they had at one time in Nebraska. And she asked if I would be willing to try to bring them back, uh, if she could get the culture committee to agree to ask people to submit seeds to bring uh, back to, to send up to Nebraska. So uh, that happened. And in 2004, the first seeds were sent up. She sent up only 25 eagle corn seeds, which you'll see later. Uh, and someone sent up a, a checkbox from their checkbook of a uh, yellow corn. And those were the two varieties that we started with growing. Um, and on the side, if you had time to read it, is how the Pawnee planted corn. Nothing like corn is planted uh, today by the large equipment in long rows in Nebraska. And this is honestly how this corn grows best. If you plant it this way, you will have much more success than planting it in rows. So there are thousands of years of working with it really taught them well how to work with it. So I'm Catholic, Deb is not, the Pawnee Nation is not a Catholic tribe at all. Um, and for a lot of tribes, there's, there's some bad history with missionaries and, and the Catholic Church. And uh, so it's been a very careful walk uh, working with, with the Pawnee. Um, but Deb was receptive from the very beginning. And, you know, we never really even talked about my Catholic faith. That was a non-issue. That was a non-subject. I wanted to learn about her ch culture and her people. And she taught me volumes. And of course, I've, then I've gone to Oklahoma twice every year that I could uh, with no COVID since then. So I've really become very familiar with the tribe. Uh, and we have a great deal of mutual respect for uh, each other. So the next slide shows that three years after we started working together, Deb and I actually met. This is in 2006. And there was no Facebook yet. And there was no way you could send a picture on a phone. So when we met three years later, and I, we had already grown corn for three years for the tribe in Nebraska, we had no idea what we looked like. So this was a big deal when she came to Nebraska uh, and we actually got to meet and she got to go to some of the corn fields. She got to see some of the corn in the field. And for the, the Pawnee, the women were the ones that grew the corn. So. Uh, such a disconnect after 174 years and hardly, you know, the corn was almost gone and nobody was growing it anymore. So for her to come back and see the corn in the fields in Nebraska, that was a, a, a really big event uh, for us. Uh, so on the next slide, this is in 2013. So this is 10 years after we met. Um, and Deb and I were standing outside of a cornfield where I was working at the archway at the same place. In the center is the eagle corn, and you can see in the center of each one of the kernels a flying eagle. Uh, and this was one that this was the one that was down to 25 kernels uh, when it was uh, finally brought back here in Nebraska. I sent 2,500 kernels back down that first year. Phew, that was quite a stressful year. Um, and on the right, there is one of the interns. We've had multiple interns come to Nebraska now from the Pawnee that we've been able to get grant funding for. So the Pawnee are coming to their homeland of Nebraska and, and we building that connection to Nebraska uh, to work in their cornfields um, and to help learn, to learn about the corn because it was almost gone for them. So that's been a wonderful thing. Uh, so the next slide then shows that in 20, oh, 2019, we had 16 varieties back in 16 years. This is my favorite picture of us because of Deb's nice laugh. I just love it. We were having a good laugh in the cornfield uh, in Nebraska. So we have 16 back. And then the next slide will show at in 2020, I love this picture of Deb growing in the red dirt in Oklahoma, uh, that in Nebraska, we had 20 gardens. I have gardeners all the way across the state of Nebraska that are volunteers. We're all volunteers. It's at our own expense. Gardening is not expensive to do. And we grow for the Pawnee and all of the seeds at the end of the year go back to, to the Pawnee. They are Pawnee seeds, not ours. And that's part of the agreement for every grower. All of the seeds must go back to the Pawnee. In Oklahoma, where the corn doesn't grow as well, but still they can grow it successfully. Um, it, we grow the seed in Nebraska now, the best seed, and then they can grow it to eat in Oklahoma. 
it's not always successful, but most of the time something is. Uh, so there were 14 different people checked it out of their seed bank because now they have a seed bank in Oklahoma for the, the tribe that, that Deb heads up, which is really neat. So the next slide then shows uh, the picture I was able to put together of 13 of the 16 varieties we have brought back to date. We started with the very first two, the eagle corn and the yellow flint corn, and all of these others have come back. Uh, it took seven years for tribal members to slowly trust, building that trust with them to come up with more out of their sacred bundles as they were opened in their families. And some of the, the varieties have come back from within other varieties. We figured out how to do that. It, it took quite a while for us to figure it out. But, uh, so that's 13 of the 16. Uh, some of them are not quite pure yet, but we're still working on it. Varieties. Uh, so then the, go to the last slide. And this is where I want to end. Um, in 2015, two years after I had my, uh, my terrible two-year eye injury, um, but my faith grew tremendously, my Catholic faith during that injury, as you might all imagine. And uh, I was supposed to lose my eye four times in two years, and I never did. And my faith really brought me through that. So in 2015, I heard about a program Loyola University was starting in our diocese, our Grand Island diocese. Uh, so I joined that. For three years, we met every Tuesday night. And in 2015, one night, the instructor came and said, Ronnie, you should read this new Laudato Si that Pope Francis wrote. It's everything you talk about when you're working, with, when you talk about working with the Pawnee. So I read it and I thought, could it possibly really be that what Pope Francis is talking about and what I'm doing with the Pawnee, which are completely disconnected from each other, could actually have something to do with each other? It was hard for me to even envision that at that point because I just was really not talking about my faith with it. Then a year later in 2016, I was facing, I think my fifth eye surgery, I don't know. Um, and I was working with corn and I couldn't figure out something that was happening with it. And I heard it was St. Kateri's feast day on EWTN. So I said my rosary on the way to work and I just prayed very quickly to her, please help me to figure something out that I've not been, and no expert can help me with this. And when I got home that night, there was my answer. Uh, and St. Kateri has been there for Deb and I over and over. And Deb is a, a, a big, huge fan of St. Kateri. And she is a Pope Francis also, by the way, uh, which I love. So, and I'm now also the volunteer coordinator for the St. Kateri Conservation Center, um, which I started working with in 2019, hoping to do this same type of thing with other tribes and with Catholic lands in the United States. Um, so I can turn it over at this point and turn it over to Deb and let her really get into the Pawnee culture and what this project has meant uh, for her and her people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Um, Deb, please. Thank you, Jose. I appreciate being here. And uh, my name is uh, Joshua Hukut. It means uh, she led a horse inside to be given away, referring to inside an earth lodge. Um, I'm calling today from um, the uh, relocated lands and for the Pawnee, Oklahoma uh, people. And uh, I, I am the keeper of the seeds for the Pawnee. Um, I love working with Ronnie. We actually adopted her um, and uh, gave her uh, a Pawnee name that means little corn sister, uh, which is what I've been calling her for years. Um, but um, I just thought I'd share a little bit about uh, what has inspired me and talk a little bit about our culture. Um, my mother was an English lit major in, in college. And um, so when I was uh, seven years old, I memorized uh, a, a poem that has stuck with me and it is a uh, flower in the crannied wall. I pluck you out of the crannies. I hold you here, root and all, with my hand, little flower. But if I could understand what you are, root and all, 
and all in all, I should know what God and man is. So that really has stuck with me. Um, I grew up uh, in gardens. My mother was a great gardener. She built forts for us out of the, fl the flowers. And, um, and uh, gardening just has always been something that I, I have always done. So it was really uh, wonderful when I started growing the eagle corn in um, Colorado in 1980s. And, um, and then when I moved down back home uh, here in Pawnee, Oklahoma in 97, um, that was one of the first questions that my cousin Nanny and I had was, well, where is our corn? Um, you know, we're the people of the corn and uh, Father Buffalo. And uh, we um, wanted to reconnect with that idea of you know, looking at our corn and have having a, a, a deep appreciation for that again. Um, so, yes, you know, I started working with the culture committee. Um, and in 1998, we had our first seed blessing. And at that time, there was three varieties of, of the corn that were blessed. And one of our elders, uh, Nora Keys, um, I mean, Nora Pratt, uh, had prayed over it. And she prayed over it in such a way that she spent over an hour explaining um, what the corn means to our people and what it tasted like and um, how her hopes were that we would be able to have that uh, for our people once more. And so I believe, you know, it was that, that prayer that started our, our program. Um, and um, there's, you know, working with Ronnie has been just tremendous. Um, like I said, you know, it is a story of friendship. Our people, when we were in Nebraska, uh, and the first settlers came, um, we didn't fight them. You know, we worked with them. We had meaningful friendships. And so the work that Ronnie and I have done, you know, I have always called it uh, maintaining homeland ties. And so re going back to the homeland is just, has always been a tremendous honor. I mean, um, we can trace our seeds down through Mexico, but we also, like many tribes, um, we have our, our uh, origin stories. And um, so in part, we were, we were the people from the stars. And when the first woman was sent down from the heavens, um, she was wrapped in, in the corn husk, having the seeds of life within her. And when the first man was sent down that uh, the first man was wrapped in a, a buffalo hide, and when he disrobed, um, threw the rope down on the ground, a herd of buffalo sprung forth. Um, that's just part of our story. Um, and so for us, um, Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, that was our home. Um, and so one of the things that that we look at um, in the soil and uh, wondering why our, our, our seeds are not doing as well in Oklahoma. Um, I mean, we, we feel like um, well, there's a lot of clay. It's it's uh, hard as concrete in the summertime, um, and it, it helps us, 
to go back to our old ways of, of planting using the hill method that you saw in the photos has been wonderful. Um, we did experience 10 years of drought. Um, and um, during that time, we started incorporating some um, hogoculture type of methods where we in inside of our hills, we we dug it out extra uh, low and put, um, well, we put corn cobs at the very bottom and and then fill it up with our, our uh, compost and uh, the good soil there. Um, and we keep the clay going around the sides because that, that turns into like a bowl, repels the water. And, um, but, um, the corn cobs, when it rains, it, it'll collect, it'll get wet like a sponge and then have a slow release of, of water to help with our uh, bringing moisture to the, the roots of our plants. And um, so there's that. And then we've also seen that our ancestors uh, have utilized um, um sunflowers so when a, a lot of tribes say that they plant a three sister garden the Pawnees always say that we use the four sister garden because we completely surround our gardens with um, the sunflower with um a um uh in the, when you plant in a thicket it it becomes that um term it for deer and even bunnies you know with their tender little noses they don't want to go through that thicket and, um but it also does a, a wonderful job in becoming a wind barrier um and ronnie can tell tell us uh how many days in a row there's 45 mile an hour winds and last year it was 17 um, where the wind just didn't seem to want to let up. Um, so that thicket will help, you know, it helps uh, control that, that environment so that our seeds will pollinate um, successfully. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, you know, our culture is real important. Um, we, we don't have a feast without our corn. Um, we do um, look forward to the day that we're able to feed our people uh, more successful than we have and you know, honor our elders, our ancestors by doing so. Um, and so we do have new hope for old crops. Um, in working with Kateri, um, that's that's a, a real for us and um i guess i kind of surprised ronnie at one point when um she had told me about kateri i i told her that we spent two years praying once a week we would do our rosary and and uh, you know we had one pawnee woman uh that was catholic and, and she was also on our culture committee, you know, so she knew how to compartmentalize very well, um, feeling very comfortable and going to mass and then turning around and going to ceremony with our, our Pawnees. So I, I am not Catholic, um, but I have been influenced by Catholics all my life. Um, and uh, told Ronnie, I think I'm, I'm a Catholic wannabe, but we spent two years going to Marlene's house and praying for Kateri. Um, and there's a lot of, of people um, in Indian country, natives that, that pray for Kateri. In, in my own family, my, my sister, um, her mother, um, Mary Shanatona um, even had the diocese uh, uh, appoint her to go um, to the Vatican um, 
for the beatification where they were able to say, Kateri, you are blessed. Um, and that was a huge honor for our family, for her to go. And she took her uh, um, granddaughter with her and her name is Kateri. Um, so huge meaning in our, our, our lives. Um, the Laudato Si is um, a doctrine that we also have great hope for, you know, but you know, in Indian country, there's a mass of hurt and healing that that needs to be take taken care of. And uh, some folks that I've talked to recently, they said, wouldn't it be nice if in this healing, before we go on into the future with Laudato Si, that Pope Francis will take a moment to address the doctrine of discovery, which was the principle of international law dating in the 15th century and its roots in the uh, papal decree de issued by Pope Nicholas V in 1452 that specifically sanctioned and promoted the conquest, colonization, and exploitation of non Christian territories and people and hundreds of years of decisions and laws continue right up to our own time can be ultimately traced back to the doctrine of discovery laws that invaded or ignored the rights of sovereignty and humility humanity of indigenous people in the United States and around the world. That would be nice for him to address that and say, we can, you know, that was a doctrine that was wrong, but let's look at and do future. Let's protect our seeds. Let's protect our plants, our soil, our water. Let's come to a seed consensus where we'll be able to say that that is important for our indigenous people to be able to not live in fear from the GMOs and seed piracy. Um, and even with our, our chiefs that we have now, you know, I have eight chiefs that look over our program they they don't allow us to give out our seeds and and we have beautiful seeds we have uh collected the the data behind them the plant growth characteristics that show the uniqueness of the seeds we've we've done the the nutritional test the the gna testing and we know that um god gave us a beautiful seed that is very valued um, so where did we go wrong, you know, with this GMO? Why is, you know, we, we don't have the nutrition that, um, that our native people now have. And so if we're to work together, you know, then we need to, to look at, at how we can protect our seeds. Um, the now for the time for healing is now. And thank you for this time. This is Deb. Thank you. Thank you, Deb, for your, your beautiful testimony. Um, and we wanted to give full, um, full time to the presenters and, and we'll seek to answer your questions, I think, after the webinar. Um, uh, two points that I wanted to raise from the Covenant's perspective is, are that um, we will be lifting up St. Kateri uh, during our uh, second annual conference. Uh, her feast day does happen during our conference, uh, July 13th to the 15th. And then secondly, for all of you, uh, for those of you who, who have Catholic lands, we are hoping, we are initially exploring ways in which we can match Catholic lands with the kinds of projects that Ronnie and Deb have engaged to continue this kind of healing. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be agriculture, could be conservation, could be renewable energy, but 
um, any uh, Catholic institutions who seek to partner with indigenous peoples where there's a match between tribal ancestral lands and Catholic lands, please feel free to contact me. This is a new initiative um, and we would love to work with any of you who are willing to engage and begin or continue this healing with indigenous peoples uh, in the Catholic church. Um, so with that, um, I wanted to thank our guests. So blessed, Deb, Ronnie, and Nikki for this time and this wisdom that you've shared with us. We hope to accompany you and other indigenous peoples uh, in our Catholic faith, in the spirit of humility, as you mentioned, Deb. Um, and so thank you and thank all of you, of your, of, uh, the, all of you participants for being interested and wanting to learn more about how we can do so. So with that, um, I wanna thank you again um, and, um, and bid you all uh, God's blessings. Thank you.